decided his kids were going to have to make some money to help pay for their college educations because that was one of the many things that was real important to my dad was an education. And so uh, we worked. We got paid. When, when we sat down at the end of the week, they divvied the money up and that was, this was and that was the way it was. So we, we had to, and we had to learn to save right then or we wouldn't have had any. <laughs> so that was basically what got started in, in the produce business. Dad owned a piece of land in Campville near where he is now, uh, where my brother is now. Actually, the, the farm is the same one. He's actually purchased one, one or two since then, since sold one of them off. But that's how actually we got started. And uh, so we did go to college, and Gina, I'll let Jeannie get into this. I went to K-State. After I went two years to the ag school in New York out on Long Island, I went to Farmingdale University out on Long Island. And uh, that's not a very hard school to get into. And my guidance counselor, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, two of my classmates are here. Brian McGavin's here someplace. Brian was in my class. And Ann over here was on, uh, Hyatt was on in, in my class. But Mr. Guido is probably the reason that I decided to go to college. He told me I was not college material and I shouldn't bother wasting time. <laughs> and I didn't really believe that until I found my old uh, report cards and I'm going to burn them. <laughs> because he was right, I really wasn't college material. So I struggled really hard getting through school. Never a high honor student. That was taken care of on this side long before I ever knew her. But uh, So I just determined. I think my book that I used the most in, the, in college was the dictionary. Because I still can't spell cat, I always want to put two T's on it. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to carry my dictionary, my little fold-up dictionary, to get through some of the classes, and especially when I had to do any writing. So I made it through school, not on the honor roll, or well, close to the one honor roll, but not close to the other. <laughs> my, uh, matter of fact, I was married while I was at Farmingdale, went to K-State, and Jeannie and I were married. We still, I still had uh, one, year. one year left. And... Um, my first semester, I got a 1-3. <laughs> no, I got before we were married, and then my after after I was married, my first semester I had a 3-3. Uh -oh. My got my uh, my <laughs> advisor called me in, obviously. I don't know what the hell I'd been doing. <laughs> but uh, I guess back then I drank all the. I don't care much for drinking. I, I'll have a social drink now and then. But during, in my college years, I guess I drank all the beer I needed to drink. The rest of my life. So I will occasionally have a drink, but I'm not one. I don't. I don't look forward to that necessarily. So that's how I got to the top of the pile here. And then the, the, the smartest thing I ever did was end up chasing my wife. Well, she didn't catch very easy. It took quite a bit. Of, took I didn't know we were going to get into all this. <laughs> she wanted to know if I was going to say anything. Oh, I so I always say something. <laughs> but anyway, I'll let her go because we. Uh, we both graduated in 1962. I was in Owego and Jeannie was in Nerd Valley. And, but we just met in an old water hole over behind Martin Helman's barn. So <laughs> Rob knows exactly where it was because he worked for Martin Helman for a little while. So that's where we actually met. And then Lila and her husband Larry are the first, the first one she had. <laughs> <laughs> just be careful. Everybody knows anyways. <laughs> Lyle and Larry and Jeannie were at the county fair. Not everybody knows this. Ron might know it. I might have told Ron this because Ron and I have traveled some together. But Bryce and I, my good friend Bryce Jackson, and he was still one of my really good friends, were down there. And Terry Standard was going in the, uh, in the service, and he was having a party. And um, so I didn't have a date. And the three of them were going down the midway, and Bryce and I were going the other way in the midway, and I said, Bryce. I think that was the gal that was at the swimming hole with us last week. <laughs> Bryce's the reason I got to there because Bryce's sister married a divorce, and Bobby told her. Bobby told Bryce about the swimming <laughs> hole in Red Valley. It's kind of a you guys are getting more information than you need to. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's how I met Jenny, and that's where it started. Go ahead. <laughs> Now, uh, well, he's hit. He's hit most everything, um, except that she was on a much different honor roll in school than I was. <laughs> um, his first.
first job was in Indianapolis and uh, working for a board milk company. And I was uh, subbing in the schools in Indianapolis, and we lived right downtown. And we didn't like it at all. We, we couldn't find anything we enjoyed doing. Um, I really didn't want to send my kids to school there. It was, uh, it was a real learning experience. And I'm glad that we, I'm glad that we did it because we learned so much. Because we knew that the grass isn't greener on the other side of the fence. You're better off on the side of the fence that you're familiar with. And um, so we were out there a little less than two years and my grandfather Newman died. And we made the trip back uh, to the funeral. And it seems like we have made most of our major decisions riding in a car because um, the telephone doesn't ring and somebody's knocking at the door and nobody's bothering you. So we made, we've made most of our major decisions that way. But we decided that uh, the only promotion he was going to get is maybe go to a bigger city, Chicago or someplace like that. And I really, well both of us, I had a wonderful childhood growing up on the farm. <laughs> And I really wanted to raise my family the same way. And the only way we could do that was to actually have a farm, and we certainly couldn't do that in the city. So uh, in 1969, uh, we bought the uh, former Adams, Harold Adams mm -hmm. farm. And uh, we were both 25 years old and went to the bank. I think we had saved about a thousand dollars on our time in, in in Indianapolis. Two years, we, that's what we saved. Yeah. Well, we had we had the original yard sale in in, in Indianapolis too. We we couldn't find anything else to do, so we'd go to farm sales and buy junk furniture. And Skip would refinish them during the week in our basement, and then we put them out in the front yard, and that's how we paid our rent. <laughs> and um, and so I don't know. We just we just didn't like. It. We weren't comfortable, so I'll get on the Anyway, I, I'm gonna the, guy, jump the neighbor across the street was retired IRS. Oh, uh, now we're getting into more. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Retired Internal Revenue Service. And he was pretty sure that I wasn't <laughs> When I unloaded the house, when, it, when I was getting ready to move, and I said, well, we're moving out of state, so. <laughs> but he was, uh, he was, he was evidently didn't like the looks of the neighborhood with my dressers and chairs. And Yard sales, <laughs> this was, uh, late 60s, yeah. and they didn't have yard sales. Oh, okay. Anyway, that's just a highlight for me. <laughs> um, so the reason, the main reason we started farming was that um, we wanted to raise the kids in a farm atmosphere. And we knew that uh, his dad had had some success with a roadside market in Campbell when Skip was growing up. And my grandmother Newman had a small roadside market down in um, Catatunk. And she said that it was a good road to try to do something like that on because uh, there was a lot of traffic. So we looked, we actually looked for the Adams Farm and, um, and ended up buying it. And um, didn't have any money, of course. And we went to the bank, Tabby State Bank, uh, Ted. Pope. Pope. Pope, yeah. Ted Pope was, he was, he was a wonderful man. I, I don't know how he ever gave us the mortgage. I, I still don't understand that. Uh, I sat on the board now and Ron Doherty just retired off the board and we wouldn't have lent the money to this company. <laughs> <laughs> well, they lent, they lent us every, we paid $30,000 for the original farm. We had $1,000, so they lent us $29,000, which now you have to at least have 25% in the kitty, 20 or 25%, and or you, they wouldn't consider it. Well, so they, they didn't lend us, they only figured that the farm was worth about 19000 and so we had to have a $10,000 demand note that they could recall any time they wanted to. And I think part of the reason that they lent us the money is my dad had always done business in Candor. Uh, Lloyd Bateman, I don't know if any of you know him, uh, but he, uh, I can remember as a kid going to the 
going to Cander, and we paid the feed bill first. We paid the Hallibex, uh grocery bill second. Mm -hmm. And then if there's any money left over, that's what you had for the month. But he, he always paid his bills. Mm -hmm. And we just got used to living on what you had. And um, I think that was an important lesson that, to learn. And that's kind of the same lesson I wanted to teach my kids, is that um, you have to work hard and you have to pay your bills. There's certain, certain things that I, I really feel strongly about. But he uh, Ted lent us the money, um, and before I left the office, he says, now Jeannie, he said, you are going to teach, aren't you? I says, not unless I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I really got soured on teaching in, in, in Indiana. I mean, they thought it was one of the new kids on the block or something like that, so. Um, I didn't, I, I, we're very lucky because I never had to teach. <laughs> well, let me get back to this. So the first few years were just, uh, we would do anything to survive. The, I may remember, Brian was uh, two years old when we brought the farm, and Bonnie uh, was born in January of 1970. And um, Skip and Brian, trapped muskrats that winter on the uh, crypts across the street. And muskrats were worth probably two or three dollars a piece then. Money was a lot different back then yeah, than it is now. <laughs> We've got a, nobody understands that, but it was a lot different. And Skip had gotten his first deer uh, during yeah. hunting season. Yeah. And we had a good rabbit dog. So we ate venison and She rabbits. got real creative with rabbit meat. She's a good dog, and I could hit the rabbit better than I could hit the deer. Really, we, we uh, had rabbit casserole, and we had all kinds of stuff. But, uh, we made it. Yep. Uh, and then um, we planted our first strawberry crop in the spring of 1970 uh, because um, strawberries were kind of that was one thing his dad was getting into was the strawberry business and so we planted, I think we planted two acres. Um, and then thinking that we were going to harvest them the next year, well the next year was 70, no I guess it was two years after. So, yeah, the next year was 71 and nobody showed up to pick the berries. Nobody knew we were there. Nobody knew we were there and nobody knew we had strawberries. So we didn't do very well then. And then the next year after that, um, Agnes? Yep, we Agnes. Had, and we kept didn't one pick, day. we kept one day. So we didn't get off to the greatest start, but uh, we both <coughs> we both knew that we were doing what we wanted to do. It wasn't we didn't start out to be um, I wanted to be successful, but we didn't start out to uh, be what it is today. It, that wasn't even in our minds. No, we couldn't we couldn't have imagined that. We, just, we wanted to survive and we wanted to enjoy our family and um, so that was our, our goal. I mean, it's changed over the year, but our basic goal is to survive farming and raise your kids the way you want to, you want, you want to raise them. Um, the Harold Adams didn't leave very much on the farm when we left. Okay, okay. <laughs> I tried to get him to throw an old farm all each tractor in on the deal. And he said, nope, 30,000 is what it's going to be. Yeah. And you know Harold. I know Harold. He worked for me. Yeah. And so uh, he charged me five bucks for the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me the iron kettle. <laughs> the iron kettle was he, he says, that was here. He didn't want to move. <laughs> but it, that's, and so that's where we got Iron Kettle Farm because he uh, he had an old sewing machine in the in the barn. He charged me for that. He charged me for the mailbox. <laughs> but he gave me the Iron Kettle, and that house has never been as clean as it was the day they left. Never. <laughs> Jeannie cut the curtains. She made her own curtains because that's what girls did. But she laid the material on the on the dining room, dining room floor and cut it. That was cleaner than you couldn't do that today. <laughs> but, 
We also lived in the house. There was not one picture in their house, not one one piece of furniture, anything on any dresser or anything. It was just stark naked. But I mean, it was an immaculate shape. It's well used now. It's well used. <laughs> but anyway, that's just a, that's how we got that's how we got our name. Is on and the uh, at the uh, original market. Well, Brian Robinson. Well, Brian was is Brian there. still here? Is Brian no, still here? Oh, because he had he was building the pond for John Schickel up on the hill, my next door neighbor. And we wanted to put the stand about where it is right now, but there was a little hump on the edge of the road. So he come down and just no no permit, just <laughs> just, just stuffed it off. <laughs> and uh, nobody's ever said anything about that. But <laughs> I, want, I wanted to thank Ron. He was in the back for a few minutes out there. You have to tell him that I give him credit. And there was an old corn crib out behind the barn. And we dragged the corn crib out front. This was in the summer of 69. And we put a little lean to on the front of it. And um, that's where, um, that was our first market. And, and many, many days we didn't make $5 a day. I would sit there all day long without a customer. And Bonnie would be in the. No, Bonnie wasn't born yet. Who was in the cradle? In the back. Brian was. Brian. Brian was in the back. He was with us. Um, no, we had a slow start. And you notice that our other buildings have lean-tos on them. The next year after the first one, we made the lean-to bigger. <laughs> and then we probably had one on each side. And then we put a barn up, and then we put lean-tos on it. <laughs> that's, how, that's how we grew, and steps and leaps and bounds. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm really going to try to stick to this. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a <laughs> So, um... Brian was two when we started, and Bonnie was born in the January of 70. And Skip's dad was a, I don't know, many of you know, knew him, but he was a wonderful man. But he, he had more ideas for things for us to do. <coughs> and the first one is he bought um, six brood sows at the auction sale down the road. And he brought them, and didn't tell us he was going to buy them, and he thought we ought to raise pigs. So they go out in the barn. How many of you know my dad and knew him? Pretty good lot. He bought him up, he bought him up Canter Hill from Lionel Field. Lionel used to raise hogs, and he had some beautiful shows here. And Dad bought three of them at an auction sale and talked to him at that, went and bought three more that week, not even going to the auction. So that's how I got started. Because we needed something to do, that's yeah. what he told us. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess who was never home? <laughs> well, I was working nights in IBM at that time. Yeah, I did work out some. I worked nights in IBM for two years, and I think I worked for Warden Renskoy and I worked for Keen Ward for, I think, two or maybe three years. We didn't get a paycheck. I think with Keen, mostly the money went in on the fertilizer bill, line bill. I think I don't I think I really took any money home. If I did, it went right back there. But we got a, uh, uh, a boar, and soon we had baby pigs. And of course, Bonnie was born about then when the baby pigs started coming and somebody never being home. Bonnie and Brian and I would go to the barn and catch the baby pigs for customers to buy and and she's always been quicker than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at one point we had um, we had a dozen brood cells and we'd have a uh, hundred pigs uh, twice a year. So that that was one way we got we had some early income. Um, I said the first market was a corn crib, and then in the summer of 72, um, we realized I was pregnant and that we were going to have another youngster in the family. And so we thought maybe we ought to build a market. Um, because I used to go in the house and take care of the kids and then run back and forth from the market to the thing. And so we put up the first market, uh, and we built it so that we had a, uh, oh, probably a room half as big as this, where I had a stove and a refrigerator, and we had a big picture window that faced to the road, and Jennifer's crib was on the other side, of so the customers would come and play with Jennifer while well, I, I waited on customers, and she was a very good baby. She, uh, she really was. She would... She just was a wonderful baby. But customers loved her too, so she helped business. <laughs> and I don't know if they stopped to see her or me. <laughs> but uh, that's that was our first market. And then, like Skip said, we put additions on that many, many times. It's still there. It's 
Well, oh, parts of it are. We? <laughs> well, the main part is yeah. still there. It's, it's, uh, I tore an old barn down over in uh, uh, Marshland, Road. Marshland Road. I was come, trying to come up with Mark. I'm having a little trouble coming up with words lately. But uh, tore an old barn down, and I had a 1971 truck. It was a pretty new truck, and I treated it terrible. We had uh, big beams in it. You, the, you ever come into our market and look up? There's big beams up top, and then there's beams going up and down, smaller ones to hold it up. But we had them in there, and when you, when uh, Benny Goodrich was helping me load them, and uh, Benny's another one of my real good friends that still survives, but he went back on the back of the truck and put down and picked front wheels off the ground with the truck. <laughs> so we can of course he came home that way. And when Benny got out of the truck down the way, I could hardly steer that. <laughs> I had to go home at about 20 miles an hour. <laughs> This, this isn't going exactly like we planned, okay? <laughs> I, I really thought we could stick to this schedule, but Maybe I don't. Maybe if I kept quiet. No, 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 no. Uh, well, we, the crops we grew were, uh, believe it or not, cabbage was one of the big crops we first started with. I can't believe the amount of cabbage people would eat. They would buy bushels of it. And uh, now we don't even grow cabbage anymore. The, over the, well, it's been 50 years, but over the years the crops have changed so much and the, you know, what was like strawberries in the 1980s, strawberries were king. I mean, they paid all the bills and, and now the, uh, um, we don't even grow strawberries anymore. It's just different, you have to change. Um, so, let's see, I'm, I'm in the 70s. Um, we started buying, um, as, as we could afford it, we started buying neighboring farms. We bought the, I think it was in 74, we bought the Doty farm across the street. Elsie's here, right? I think it was about 74. Uh, and that uh, gave us access to the uh, creek. And in order to grow strawberries and grow them consistently, we needed water for irrigation. And so that was one of the main reasons we bought the Doty Farm, uh, uh, because we uh, hired the, uh, well, I don't know, was it, I don't, I don't remember who we hired, but anyway, we had no, a pipe the, put under the road. The first water I think we got come, come across, come through the sluice pipe that's up the road, okay. run across the yard of where Cheryl and... But eventually this, the, uh, we got a permit from the state and, and we put water under, under uh, 96 so that we could, we could grow strawberries. Um, and then we bought the, uh, the Schickel Farm. Uh, it used to be where Donnie Roberts lived, right? That was his farm. Um, for, and we, first we bought the, the land out back because he, he had um, he built a new house next door and got transferred to Manassas uh, with IBM. And so we bought the land out back and in 73 or 74, my dad bought his house. So the house right next door to us, my dad had purchased in the mid-70s. Um, well, that, was, that goes back to another thing that I always want. I always wanted to live next door to my mom and dad. And I, all growing up, I was, I was positive I was going to live next door. And as it turned out, they lived next door to me. <laughs> it's, it's ironic how things that you think about when you're a kid come back. Because my sister was my sister was three years younger and didn't enjoy the farm as much as I did. And she was, wanted to marry somebody wealthy. She wanted to live in a big city. She wanted a big fancy house. And I wanted to live on a farm next door to my mom and dad. And it's exactly how it went. I just, it's, it's weird. It really is weird. Well, let me get back to this. Um, so we added acreage um, to the farm because we only had 52 acres to start with, and it was only 20 tillable. Some of that was marginal, though, but on the back, by the hill. Yeah. And that's one thing that Quadrant Extension and Cornell said that. The farm wasn't anywhere near big enough to um, to ever amount to anything. And so, because with 20 acres, you, you really can't grow too much. So, um, 
But the building hub farm had a seven or eight acre piece to make our 19 or 20 acres, 27 or 28 acres, because we took the hedgerow out. Brown again took the hedgerow out, cleaned it all up, and now, now, now we, well, I, I can find where the hedgerow used to be. It's, you know, it's just all one big field. It's down in our south parking lot for the for the window. Um, and then we were noticing, I mean, sales were increasing uh, in the 70s, uh, but we were noticing that people would go up the road and turn around and come back. And I mean, it was very, very obvious what was happening is they were missing us. We were really depending on traffic and they were missing us, they were driving by us. So in 1979, we had to idea that we would move our house so people could see the market. And um, it took us about, well, I think we started in 76 trying to decide if we were brave enough to do anything like that. And um, 79, we completed it. And immediately, we had an increase in business because people were driving right by us. They, they didn't even know we were there. So that was, that was the first big major decision we had to make and uh, I'm glad we made it. I'm glad we made it now. Uh, now we get to the 80s and that's um, that's where we really started growing. Uh, if you remember back, I don't know, 82, 83, 84, there was this fuel crisis where the fuel really jumped and everybody think there wasn't going to be enough fuel, so they couldn't go on vacation. It was a it was a crisis. Uh, they had big limits here, three bucks a time or something. Yeah, gas right. Rack and, stuff like that. and we decided that we had to di diversify our. Uh, they had to change because you couldn't just we're only open six months, and we had to produce more income during that six months, so we decided to um, start our greenhouse business. And that kind of started, we um, had gone to a sale and bought a used greenhouse in Ithaca, brought it home on a hay wagon and set that up. And didn't know much about growing anything, but uh, Clark and Linda Rickings were good friends of ours. And that was where, you know, where Del Ricks used to be. Well, Clark and Linda and uh, what was the name? What was the dad's name? Henry. 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 They really helped us a lot. I used to go up and, and buy a lot of my hanging baskets from him. And he kept telling me, he says, You can do this. He, you says, can you do can, this. he says, This isn't hard. You can do this. <laughs> and so slow, very slowly, we, uh, we started learning how to, to grow things and to sell them. And Jennifer took a, a real interest in the greenhouse and she went to. She graduated from high school in um, 91, I think. And she went to Cobble Scale and majored in uh, greenhouses, you know, growing greenhouses. And, and so there's one of us that has an education down there about growing plants. Um, I'll get back to that. But anyway, that's, again, we had, we had to do something to change. Uh, you, you can't just, you can't stay stagnant and and survive. I mean, you think you can, but you can't. You've got to be able to change. You've got to see what's coming down the road and think ahead a little bit. And I'll make those major decisions before you have to make a plan. A plan. We, and uh, we've been very fortunate at doing that. During this period of time, we joined some organizations, national organizations, and we'd go to their annual meetings and we'd share our scrapbooks with them and we'd learn so much from the North American for Strawberry Growers, <coughs> New York, the NASCA, what's that? Farm Markets? That's the next thing on the list. Is it? Right here. Okay. So all of these ideas that come on weren't all, didn't all come out of our hearts because we'd share our scrapbooks and stuff with other people and then we'd share theirs. And so we, we know people all over the United States, mostly in the North Central and New England. And North Noel, North American Straw, New York State Strawberry Growers thing. Uh, got it. He was on the board of that organization, and he was also on the board of the North American Strawberry Growers. But uh, and then we became members of the North American Farmer Direct Marketing. 
um, association, but those three organizations got us out of Tioga County, got us out um, so you could see what other people were doing. And uh, Frank Wilds was our extension agent at that time. I don't know. Did Frank come in? Is he back there? That no. Come in? no. But he, anyway, being close to Cornell, we, if we had a real problem and we didn't know who to call, we'd call Frank and he'd, tell, he'd make a phone call and we'd take whatever, if we had a disease we didn't know what the heck to do with, we'd go to Cornell. We've done that a lot more than once, many times. Cornell's been very good to us. Yep, it has. But that would help, that's how you learn. And, then, and also you get on the telephone to some guy in Chicago or West in Illinois, the other side of there, and we talked to Tom, Tom or Rodney, one of those guys out there might have the answer to it. So we got good friends that we can just pick up. Oh, you met Rodney Johnson, right? Oh yeah, we were broke down coming home from a trip. <laughs> we stopped at Rodney's. <laughs> Linda, you were with us that day. No, you weren't. No. Amish were with us that day. Uh, well, anyway, so we got through the 80s. Uh, and then the uh, 1990s was another big, big step. Uh, growing up, um, the kids growing up, um, my, my beliefs were that if you were going to live on a farm, you ought to work on the farm. And we had paid jobs and non-paid jobs. And the non-paid jobs were cleaning the barn, taking care of the animals, uh, cleaning the house, mowing the grass, putting the hay in, anything that was related to living on the farm, which I thought was very important. And the non-paid jobs, or no, the paid jobs were, if it had anything to do with selling at our market. Picking cucumbers, picking summer squash, corn. The kids loved to pick tomatoes. I mean, that was one of their very favorite things to do. Huh? Um, Bonnie's still in the corner. Oh. <laughs> I forgot she was here. <laughs> oh, by, by the way, how many people, how many people in this room actually work for us? One time or another? And how many of you had kids that, kids that worked for us? I could never get my kids to pick some of them, did you? Um, we're always, I, knew, I knew we had a pretty good group. We're always running <laughs> into somebody. In fact, I ran into somebody today. And I had no idea who she was. And she says, I used, I used to work for you. And I had so no she was idea. a vet tech at the office. I had no idea who she was. And it makes me feel so bad. It, just, it does. But, we, but. we literally had hundreds of kids. And they'll... I can't remember them. I really can't. I feel so bad. But they, you know, we worked with them when they were 15, 16, and now they're 35 yeah. and 40. <laughs> They've changed a little. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I just, I, I thought of that and I wanted to know. I know we had a good smattering of our good friends that we went to college, high school with, and uh, and friends of friends, and we've just been able to tap into the local, the local people, has made quite a difference, so we can operate. And it's still to this day. It's even more dependent on it now because we have all our kids in the, on weekends. We have people working a cash register. I have no idea who it is. I don't need to know. Money's <laughs> in charge of that. <laughs> <laughs> but we do use our friends and neighbors and everything. And people take weekends and come up and work for us on their weekends in October and late September. And uh, we couldn't do it without our without the community. No, there's no way we could. No. So if you want anything to do on a weekend in October, just show up. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we were talking about the 90s. Um, I was talking about the kids working. Um, I, I can remember putting Bonnie in a backpack and hanging her on the side of the truck while I picked cucumbers. <laughs> um, we, we didn't have any money, we couldn't afford any help, so the kids always went to the field with us. And um, I don't, you know, I was always afraid I was too hard on them. I really, I really did. I thought, well, I didn't think Bonnie would ever, ever come back to the farm. Bonnie was think she was even. <laughs> when she was uh, uh, getting ready to go to college, she wanted to go, she wanted to get as far away from home, I mean, her mother. <laughs> as she could, and uh, I wanted her to stay in New York State, so she went to Fredonia. But she went to Fredonia with uh, an option to 
transfer to Cornell. It was a 3-2 program that she was in. And she, she really wanted to get away, but I think, if I'm not sure, I think she called me every day. I think I did too. <laughs> Before a cell phone. Oh, yes. Uh, and then uh, Brian, um, he went to, he went a year to Cobleskill and he didn't like it. He, he really didn't like college. He didn't like the social life. Um, he lived in a, uh, his roommate was the, uh, what do you call it, floor? R.A. RA. RA. His roommate was the R.A. And I guess they partied pretty hard. And he did, he did not like it at all. And he was a farm boy from down in Nicholas. Yeah. And um, then we had to Cornell. <laughs> but part of part of the, uh, the well, the thing is, uh, that was another one of our goals. Is I wanted my kids to, to go to college, and like his dad's um, philosophy, um, I didn't think that Skip and I should have to pay for it. I thought they ought to work for themselves and and, and uh, make their own money, pay their own way through school. So. The 80s were good because um, they had several 4-H projects that paid off pretty good. Brian had two grand champion steers one year at the fair and... and he had grand and, and reserve both. And they, uh, well, I keep forgetting the odds here. But she keeps telling me that I, that I, already, I always paid them, but I paid them on the way to the bank. <laughs> because in the car. <laughs> that, the pay, I mean, there's not paid jobs, you just have to do it because you're there. And the paid jobs, you put the money in the bank. All of it. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't that bad, was I? Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> but anyway, for much, but. the uh, interest rates in the mid-80s, if you remember, was like 15, 16 percent. And these, these kids had, I mean, minimum wage was $2 an hour when we started. And they weren't old enough to get two dollars an hour, so they'd get, you know, if they could walk, they might get twenty-five cents an hour or fifty cents an hour, and it kind of worked out. So they weren't overpaid, but they were paid. And I, I don't know how, I don't know why it worked. It, anyway, it did. Um, so they had enough money to go to school um, in the bank, and so Skip and I didn't have to pay for it. Um, then they started. Uh, graduating from high school and then from college, Bonnie graduated from Cornell in um, 1992 and Jennifer graduated from Cobleskill in 93 and Brian was already home. Bon Brian had taken the money <coughs> that he had saved for college and he came to me and, and told me he just, he really didn't like school. He didn't like the social life. Well, Roy, you remember Brian as a kid. Yeah, yeah. He had him in school. Yeah. Uh, he, was a, he was a farm kid. He liked being home. He liked being on the farm. And so uh, he took his college money and um, bought into a, a piece of property with us. We bought the flat behind the, used to be the sale barn in the Wiggle. Mm -hmm. And Brian, part of Brian's money went into that that piece of property. So he, he started investing. Uh, instead of going to college, he started investing. Um, let's see. We, I don't remember how old we were in 1992, but most of our friends that were in business like we are from around the country uh, really thought quite strongly that we should not bring the kids into the business because, that, early. that early because they were just out of college. And um, uh, I, both of us, we felt that if they're there and they're putting their time in, they ought to be getting some of the, not just getting paid, but they ought to be getting, I don't know the right return. Words. The return on investment. Yeah. Part of the business. Yeah. And so, <laughs> part of the business. Yeah. So in '92, we uh, uh, we got a, a lawyer and an accountant and a uh, financial planner, and we formed our first partnership with the kids in 1992. 
and um, we did it with Brian and Bonnie, but the stipulation was that if Jen Jennifer decided she wanted in at the time that she graduated, she would automatically come in as an equal partner. And um, so in 1992, we started gifting them. The financial or the accountants kind of figured this out. You can give so much money a year, uh, and we could do it with property. Right, or interest in the farm, I guess you would call it. Yeah. And so they, uh, they now, the kids now own, I think I own, you and I own, you own 10% and I own 10%. 10.1, what is it, Bonnie? <laughs> we don't own much anymore. <laughs> we but, don't own our house. <laughs> no, we don't. But we don't do much anymore either. <laughs> That's we, we, not we true. We have a house, That's Georgia true. over here in the corner, Georgia Smith, she, she moved into the house. She's Uncle Ed's cousin, Isla's second cousin or whatever. And then when we have a house, we did have to move in with her if the kids threw us out. <laughs> I wouldn't carry out, George, or we'd move in the other bedroom, all right? <laughs> um, but we, uh, at the same time, we, uh, in order to do that, uh, we formed another partnership because Skip and I owned um, the land, the, the extra land that we purchased. Uh, you know, we had purchased that before 1992, so the partnership was just Iron Kettle Farm. It was the original 52-acre farm and the business, and that's what that's what the kids started uh, getting a hold of. And then the rest of the land, because we bought we had bought the uh, the land behind the sale barn, uh, we had bought the uh, Wiggle f uh, Flat down by Devil's Elbow. Uh, I had bought my dad's other farm up on um, Upper Fairfield. Upper Fairfield. Um, we owned quite a bit of land, and we kept that into what they called a, a realty partnership. And Skip, Skip and I still own, own that partnership. Um, they just thought if it got split up more, uh, chances of, because, uh, you know, the business that we run, there's quite a bit of uh, chances of great liability. I mean, it's you never know what's going to happen. So the, the planners decided that they would split that up back then. Um, let's see. We've been very fortunate to uh, have gotten some awards that uh, I feel sometimes weren't deserved. I don't know. I'll, 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 we were very satisfied and happy with what we're doing. I never, well, I do now, but I think back then I didn't. <laughs> now I wonder why I did this. <laughs> uh, back then, we really, really enjoyed uh, building that farm. And I wanted, I always, my, always in the back of my mind is, I want this to be a place for other people to bring their grandkids and be able to enjoy it as much as I enjoy doing it. I mean, we, we did, we, we enjoyed it very, very, or at least I did. I'm not sure that the kids all did, but I did. I skipped it to them. <laughs> oh, that, re I got, sorry. That, I, Ron's got a word that I want him to explain. Oh. oh. Okay, Ron, you're on. Oh, she put me on the spot. One of my favorite words is uh, synergism. That if you add certain components together, what you get out of that result is much greater than what you start with. If you take the Skip and Jeannie and you look at them, you say, well, that's two people. But no, it's not two people, it's 22 people. <laughs> because the combination, uh, Skip, of course, had certain skills in agronomy and things he liked. Jeannie had business skills and you know, life school. But when you add those two things together, they're much greater than the, the, the two you start with. And synergism has always been one of my favorite words because you can look behind people or organizations and usually find one, two, or three where the sum total gets much greater than the one, two, or three you start with. So Ron, they're always my example. Ron always made me feel good when he would say that word and then I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, we had a some of the awards that we've got is in 92, the year we formed our partnership, uh, we got the uh, New York State Governor's Award for Farm Family of the Year. Um, that really, really surprised me. Um, to think of all the farms in New York State 
I think there was four of us picked for that award that year. It was the governor gave out the award at the New York State Fair, and you know I was very very pleased with that. And then um, I think it was in about 1998 um, we received the first agritourism is a word that hasn't been around forever, but we received the first uh, New York State Agritourism Award uh, for our agritourism. <laughs> that surprised me. That really surprised me. But it also made me feel good. That, I don't know. My my goal was always to have the best farm we could have, doing what we like to do. Um, and you know, we've been there 50 years now, and we've got. Let's see how many grandchildren. Nine grandchildren. So far, I've found one that will even offer to come back home. <laughs> <laughs> but when my kids were that age, they didn't want to come back home either, so maybe they're still home. Um, I probably have left a lot of things out. I tried to, where's the, uh, where's, did I follow my, she wanted me to have an outline. So how did I do? Great. Excellent. Okay, Linda. Okay, when did, you didn't mention, when did you start with the pumpkins? We started the first year we were there. Oh, really? With the pumpkin display? Yeah. yeah. You know first the old, you know the old, uh, one of, we still use one of the displays. Yeah, the corn. No. The old no, wash, the old copper wash kids. machine. The three little uh, kids that lost their mittens. Well, I can just remember bringing my kids up there and you didn't, so it was right from the beginning. Was, the first one was oh. the fall of We only had three or four characters, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't have... Well, we had a really bad snowstorm that October, too, and everything was covered with snow. <laughs> <laughs> you had the pumpkins before you had you the strawberries. Yes. yes. Like, you know, well, not really, because we planted yeah. strawberries yeah. and pumpkins yeah. both in the spring of 70. But in terms of marketing. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Somebody you know, that that's what I was curious Well, no, my dad. Okay, well, there is a story there. Originally started uh, where um, Nichols, where Tower Gardens is now, it used to be Nichols Florist. The and they, as far, as far as we can remember, they they had the first pumpkin display. They put up a few characters out in front of They used of to have a big snake that went up the pole out front oh. and they threaded it on there. And Mrs. Nichols. And I went to school one day on a school bus and they'd been vandalized and they, everything was torn down. Oh. And that's the last time they did it and they said they weren't ever going to do it again. We got to know So Mrs. my dad Nichols. went to see them. This is back in, I graduated in 62, so this is in the late 50s. And dad went to see them and wanted to know if he was trying to figure, figure out something to do to keep us kids busy. And so he, they said they weren't going to do it, they were getting old. And, we, and after a while, we, they gave us a bunch of stuff. Now, I got to know Mrs. Nichols and after we started our, dis, our display, and she gave me some, some, of, some of her display of heads and stuff that she had made. Made out of gourd. But we're, we found out, uh, you know, we just thought it was the normal thing to do it. Halloween time was to put up a display because that's what this area had had. And as we got to going to the meetings around the country, nobody else does it. But very, mo very few. most people very. live near a big city or big population and they can't because of vandalism. We've had vandalism over the years, but it's been very, very minimal. But uh, nobody else puts up a, a pumpkin display. The year before last, somebody sold Humpty Dumpty. It was a pumpkin. It was about this big. I don't know how many. <laughs> <laughs> it just disappeared. Oh, so they, but that kind of stuff, it's not good. But it, you can stand that. You know what I mean? They're kids. Well, it's you know? not like it's, it's not like coming in, in and in smashing. In a big, everything. big city, we couldn't we couldn't do what we. Mm -hmm. But we could also have more business if we lived near a big city because mm -hmm. people had to come at least thirty miles. Um, and we're, I don't know, we're finding out that. Uh, the more places we travel, um, they come up from all over the Northeast. Well, back when you started that, you didn't have internet mm -hmm. and advertising, it. so you know you had to yeah. slowly gain. Oh, yeah. You told me one time it takes two or three years for you to try something before it really takes off. Yeah. Ten years. <laughs> <laughs> I get going and then ten before you really I know the problem. Yes, I remember. The only thing that I, was different than that is. I was, uh, 
uh, Mar Fisher wanted me to make donuts. <laughs> okay? And since he had a hand in our business. <laughs> but we were visiting some, fr some friends in... Uh, no, it was up in New England. We got a couple of them. We went, when we went to look at that train. We oh, in Keene, New Hampshire. Keene, New Hampshire. And we went in there, and this guy, had, he was telling us how good this donut machine, he had three or four donut machines all lined up so that when people would come mornings, he'd start one, then he'd start another. And he had another one, and I said, boy, that's something I had to try. He says, I got, a, I got an older machine, I'll sell you. So he, uh, he sold the machine to me, I think, for $600. Gave me a bag of donut mix. I went to a food show and uh, Kex Foods or no, <coughs> Kex Foods was different. But anyway, they gave me a bag of. <coughs> the first day I run that machine, I took it in six hundred dollars. <laughs> so I bought two donut machines since then. <laughs> and, but it was that was one of the things that. But we already had the food concession going. We're making popcorn and candy and caramel apples and stuff like that. But that was the. That was the only time I ever bought a piece of equipment, sold it, or paid for it the first day I had. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is pretty much what we've got to say, but what I wanted to say was that we, we really, really enjoyed what we were doing. And, and uh, we never thought of it as to be a failure. Um, we've, had, we've had bad years. We had a really bad one last year. It was really wet, but uh, we've always enjoyed I'm so glad for not teaching school. <laughs> yeah, last year was one of the worst years we've had. Uh, our parking lots. Our parking lots are blue. Brian's been working them with the skids there, scraping up, making topsoil because it was. We're working on pretty gravelly ground, but the sod got really greasy. They didn't sink in over inch, inch and a half, but it was just slime. That's all. So he, he pushed it up in piles. He got some pretty good topsoil out of that that we put in there. We did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got that big greenhouse from your family, right? We bought that. Oh, that's not that used to be, uh, We bought that in 96. That was part okay. of George's greenhouse yeah. in North yeah. Valley. And that's when their boy came into okay. the business, he... I knew George and Pearl very well. He used to uh, drive my school. We used to buy school. plants from them. Yeah. and stuff when we first started. Yeah. They helped us get started, too, teaching us how to grow things. But um, uh, we bought that in 96, and the, um, it was up for foreclosure. And we tried to get some other people in the area that had greenhouses and markets to buy it because uh, the bank owned it and it was on. I mean, Skip couldn't really go to the bank and, and offer anything for it because he was on the board. But we, we tried to we tried to get it sold for him through other people that might be interested in that greenhouse. And everybody was afraid of the asbestos that they thought were in the boilers. And nobody would touch it. And uh, finally, one grower did make him an offer and uh, and then backed out of it because oh, they accepted the offer. They accepted it. And the and SBA then, owned, I don't know, what, 75 percent of it or something. It was an SBA guaranteed loan that the bank had joined in with. And so they, uh, I come home and I told Jeannie that, oh, I guess George is sold after one board meeting. and. Uh, she said, oh, I wish we could have bought that. And then I go back the next month and they say, no, what's his name, backed out, I don't want it. So I, again, I went to Marv and I said, Marv, I says, I'd like to buy that, but I don't want to do anything that's shady, shady on, the, on the, you know, I want Conflict. this above board. Well, you said, have to if you're on the, you have to. Well, yeah, because the, the people that are on the board of directors of the bank, uh, you can't show any favoritism to them. They could show more favoritism to you or you yeah. than to me. Mm -hmm. And but it's, and so we. Uh, so we, I says, if I up the same offer, you think that would be? You know, I had this little conversation where I didn't want to. I didn't, so, and that's what I did. I offered what I, what the other offer was, and they accepted it. And so we. And so that's we, how we got it. We. Uh, we didn't pay much for the greenhouse or the property. Cost us seventy thousand dollars to get it moved. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, it was over a hundred because we. They originally it had regular window glass in the top, and they wouldn't put it up with window glass in there because when the window glass breaks, it comes down in big pieces. When tempered glass breaks, it comes down like rain, ice ice cubes. Mm -hmm. So we. So that's. Ninety six. We moved that house over to our farm. And the only thing we did wrong there is we put it on the wrong side of the road. 
because as the business grew, we could have used that indoor space in October with a bigger gift shop or bigger anything. We, we weren't But we're not smart. moving it again. No, not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put a parking lot over there. Uh, but, uh, and then um, the, the only reason we really bought that property was for the greenhouse. And uh, then we sold it to uh, uh, one of the girls that worked for us for what we originally paid for it, which she got a really Plus improvements. We put some money yeah. in there. Yeah. And then we carried the mortgage on it and helped them along. And, and now, sorry. Because both the piece of property that I bought, Carl Klausner carried the mortgage on the property bought that was Klausner's, uh, used to run the dairy. Uh, what was it? Highland Dairy. Highland. Dairy. Yeah. Well, was that family owned that, owned that piece of property. And so he, he carried the mortgage in that one, and then I think I bought a piece of property from Dick Waltman, and Dick carried the mortgage on that. So not that I didn't like the Iowa State Bank, but these guys were willing to do that. And, and that's how we've sold most of our property. And we've sold our property. It's, 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 it's kind of bad that that can't happen more often now. Because that's, I don't know, that's the friendly farmer way of doing things. Mm -hmm. We used to get together in the fall. We'd, we'd go in the fall and we'd make our interest payment. And then if we had $10,000 or 20 or 15 or 5, we'd put that with it. And then the next year we'd work whatever percentage it was on that figure and then we'd reduce it and get, it, get them paid off. So that's how we did it. So I guess that's it. Anybody else got any questions? Uh, Carol does. I, I, I'll go ahead. I just had a question. Uh, how do you see the future of the ag-related produce in the business in terms of revenue versus the riding things and the, the commercial side of the business that you run? If, if Is there a future like in the plant business, in the pumpkin business? I, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, and I'm so glad that we started when we did. Yeah. Because people now can go to Wegmans or any grocery store and yeah. buy very, very good quality fruit, vegetables, yeah. anything they want, no matter what day it is. Yeah. I've had people call us in the middle of the, in February and want to know if the strawberries are in the <laughs> They are so, people are so used to having yeah. exactly what they want, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. whatever they yeah. want. Yeah. They don't have any idea of what it's seasoned for anything. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the grocery stores have done a really so. great <laughs> job of getting stuff very, very <laughs> fresh. It's I mean, you buy wonderful out. quality. And uh, if we didn't have our agritourism thing, uh, I don't think we'd stand a chance. Okay. Because, and the other thing is that it, it costs too much to produce uh, fruits and vegetables anymore. Uh, there's there's so many regulations and rules and, and weather and weather and yeah. weather. Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad we started when we did because I don't think we could possibly start now and get anywhere. Okay, thank you. I remember one thing that Gina told me as we got to our business where we finally were kind of making a go of it and and had to pay some income tax. And I remember Gina saying, "says Well, it's not right." It's not natural to go backwards all the time. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a, uh, that's the thing about uh, income taxes, you know, if you have a good year, the government takes it away from you. Mm -hmm. If you have a bad year, they don't give it back. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. Uh, what do you uh, foresee for 2024? Grandchildren work. Yeah. yeah. That's that is not the issue. The, uh, the, whether the kids are going to work or want to work, yeah. the grandchildren work. I mean, work. Well, that's it's because I grew up with the mother I had. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's not the problem. The problem is today. 
what are they going to be able to do with the phone? What they, you know, I've told my kids very long. Um, obviously, Darren and I both have right said, um, go to school. College is probably the best four years of your life. Go, have fun, experience things, get out of candor, see what's out there. Um, get an education wherever you want it. My oldest son is a nurse. Um, I, I, well, I told him, this was several years ago, I said, I got about 20 years left in me. You guys got that much time to figure it out. If you want to come back, I'll help you. If you don't, it's okay. And that's what basically they said to us. No, they, obviously, you can't force somebody back into a business if, if you don't really love it. So. But asking kids to have responsibility and to uh, you know, have chores to do and things to do, it doesn't hurt. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people are scared of, of having their kids do a little bit of work or have a little bit of work. It doesn't hurt them at all. Have some responsibility. Well, and I told my kids too, it's not my job to be your best friend. <laughs> I thought I was your best friend. Well, we are now, but. <laughs> it took a long time to yeah. get there. It took a long time. <laughs> Carol, did you have something? Oh, how did your uh, friendships and partnerships with the Amish begin? Um, it began about um, 20, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, we used to. Uh, one thing that we tried to grow years ago and didn't have much success at was cantaloupe because our growing season isn't long enough. And so we, uh, at some of these national meetings that we would go to, we uh, found out that uh, Lancaster and York, Pennsylvania are a good place to uh, cantaloupe and peaches are big crops down there. And so uh, we've got with an extension agent from Penn State and he hooked us up with a couple of growers down there and we started going down to uh, Pennsylvania buying peaches and cantaloupe. And then uh, gradually we started going to different uh, wholesale markets, you know, like Pro the old, the old produce Pro auctions. And uh, it just kept going every year and, and got, you, I, we loved it. We liked to ram anyway. We liked to go. And then the gift store come into play and we go to some down there and uh, the gift shows where the Amish would get together and show their wares. And so we'd go down and then we, we really got connected with one family. One and family. Um, uh, for some reason, we, we just clicked with them. And we don't know how it happened, but uh, they had 10 children. And I think they only had one or two married when we first started going down. And we'd visit them every time we went down. We used to go at least once a week. And uh, of the 10 children, um, the youngest one, anime. Well, it's, uh, it's unusual for the Amish community to mix with, we're English. We're fancy people, English. And uh, anime was, um, well, I think she's 26, 27 now. She was 12 years old. She came up and spent a week with us at the farm. And it was, it was very unusual for them to let um, a girl come. And the next couple of years, uh, some of the grandsons came up and, and spent a week. And then the next year, two of them came together and spent a week. And um, at one point, they rented a bus um, and came up and spent three or four days with us and stayed overnight. The entire family, the Fisher family. Yeah, yeah it was the entire family. All the kids, grandkids. And, but um, we put them up in all the bedrooms we could, and of course we didn't have enough bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So they had sleeping bags, and a lot of the kids slept on the greenhouse benches in the greenhouse. And those we black had, benches they pushed them together, and they had some mattresses that were on there. Yeah, they, they were camping. There. We had a uh, <laughs> we have that concession stand in there, and so. I, I would fix all the meals, you know, for everybody. And of course the girls would help you. But see, by this time we knew each other very, very well. Mm -hmm. And um, the first meal I remember fixing, uh, the girls were helping me, and, I mean the Amish girls. And, and we were getting ready to eat, and I says, well, come on girls, get the, get the kids around. And I says, we're gonna, we're gonna get started. And they all started giggling and laughing. And I says, men always eat first. 
I said, not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime they're here. <laughs> so the, the men went along with it. I mean, they're very fun people. I mean, and you can tease them. And I really enjoy them. At least this, this family. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ones on the, up in Fairfield. Oh, yeah. They're, they're the same, the same way. way. Once you get to know them, especially once they knew that we were farmers and we worked the land and they, they respected us for that, and then, then it was a whole, a whole change. And even, on, even at the produce auction. We got to know some of the, the tomato grower that we used to like. We, we, certain growers, their product would look better. So we'd try to buy this one gentleman's tomatoes if we were buying good tomatoes, you know, like tomatoes. And then there's, not, there's a couple of them. And once they realized that we, because we'd get chatting with them, they'd look at you, then they'd, they'd always say hi to you when you come in and things like that. So. But at the, uh, so the, it went very well. There was, they're very, they like sports. They're very, very competitive. They love sports. And they, sh they showed our, our grandkids what sports were really like. <laughs> <laughs> they really mean it. <laughs> they, yes, they are very competitive and very sports-minded. But this went on, I don't know, they were there two or three days, whatever. And the next week, we, had, we went down to, to Lancaster again to um, buy another load of produce at the auction. and. Uh, we spent the night with them sometimes. Yeah, sometimes we spend the night night with the grandparents. But anyway, uh, we went over to Elmers. Elmers had a dairy farm and they had a big um, fire. Everybody sat around the big circle. You know, mm -hmm. girls were coming out from the house with a tray of watermelon, and um, I said, "Let me have that watermelon." So I take the watermelon from the girls and I march into the circle. I said, "Okay." Girls or kids and women eat first. <laughs> and Elmer jumps right up and he says, Wait a minute, this was all fun. He wasn't really cross at me. Wait a minute, what happens in New York stays. <laughs> <laughs> and, they took it very <laughs> And not only that, but when they got ready to leave the 50 of them, she lined them up next to the bus for a picture. Oh. And they did it, they loved it. They all have a picture of it, and yeah, it's, on their, it's on their wall. So. Okay. All right. Okay. Anybody else got any questions? Keeping you guys up. We have refreshments. Stay, have some refreshments. Visit. Uh, thank you, Jackson. Didn't sign the lip. Didn't sign the lip. I don't know what it is. No. 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 No.